So when you're meeting with a buyer and preparing them to start making offers, say, hey, I would expect there to be more than 10 offers on any of the properties. So you're going to be competing against nine other people with any other offer you put forward. With buyer's agents. Okay, so now let's let's now you you just kind of drop social classes. Don't put that in the love letter. But you've now dropped down to the buyer agent side of things. And in this market, you're in a different social class if you represent a buyer. You're now you're just one of the the 40 people feigning for Joni's affection to 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 even look at her son's house. And because Joni is the listing agent, she's got a little bit more power. But I know a lot of us have buyers right now, and that's really tough. And I'm going to make the same disclosure on this. And you've heard me make it before. If we're talking about buyer age, you know, if I can train buyer agents right now on the lead conversion process in a low inventory market, I would start with their mindset. And it's the same mindset on the listing side that if you've got two or three buyers, you can't find a house for, I mean, you can only pour so much information into two or three buyers. Okay. You know what I mean? You can't control when the listing inventory comes and you can't control if there's anything to show them. You can't, all you can do is put your best offer forward. And after that, it's outside of your control if they pick one of the other 39 offers. So worrying about your buyer, your two or three buyers all the time is not going to really, you know, be a good excuse <laughs> uh, as to why you're not selling as much as you want to in this market. We need to be lead generating for more buyers and sellers. And if anything, taking those three buyers and turning them into 13 buyers, now you're gonna be busy. Now you're gonna be writing an offer every single week and putting things under contract regularly because you've got greater than four times um, increased likelihood of putting something under contract. So we always wanna build our pipeline. So we create a pipeline mind mentality instead of just that customer service mentality. Because again, there's only so much service you can focus on here. Um, so we need to get more clients to, to, to service and that'll solve the income problem. So again, put customer service in its place um, and at least carve out some time for sales and marketing in your business, okay? So with that said, what are some of the tricks, tips, strategies, methods that some of you are using to get your buyers in this competitive market, get their offers accepted? And what are you, what are the scripts and what are some of the techniques you're using with your buyers themselves? How are you setting their expectations? What are you doing that's working for you? That's making them calm, keeping them patient, not keeping them from getting frustrated and getting them to write strong offers. I know for myself, can you all hear me? I can hear you, Felicia. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, so for myself, I set them up with the expectation from the forefront. This is a crazy market. Um, that we're in right now, um, you may be submitting more than one offer. You may get an offer denied. I don't want them going in with the expectation that their offer is going to be accepted because at that point, this market is too crazy for that. So I'm, I'm doing that initially. I'm also initially setting them up to tell them that the likelihood is that you're not going to have your full contingencies. You may want to remove some, you may want to lessen some. Um, I'm having those conversations with them as we go and we're submitting offers. And ultimately I'm letting them make that decision, but we're discussing it so that they're aware of what those options are. Um, and that's how, my last offer that we got, uh, my buyer accepted, we lessened the, all of the contingencies, we removed the appraisal contingency and they offered a 60,000 over. And their offer got accepted um, there you pretty go. Much right away. Um, so it was nice. We had one conversation with the um, agent, and they had a conversation with their um, in uh, their mortgage person, and it was a done deal. Cool. I want to try an extra. That is awesome, Felicia. Thank you for that. Um, and that's, I mean, that's great. You got a client to make those scary sacrifices, all of which are scary. Anytime you get rid of an appraisal, it's just scary, but it. It is what it is. All you can do is convey the market, explain it, tell them the risk involved, and they take it, not you. I mean, I, sometimes I like to confirm that in an email just so they know that you know, so we've got some uh, some proof that we did tell them those risks and things. But I think you have to. Okay, so what? Here's what I want to do: an exercise. I think you'll all like. Expand out your gallery view. So switch your screen to gallery view so we can all see each other. 
and you're going to see most people have their camera turned off and that's okay. Although if you could turn your camera on, now would be a wonderful time just for a couple minutes, but you don't have to, I'm not going to like get into your personal life that much, but here I want, and there's, there's a reason we're going to do this. Okay. I, I want to know, have any of you been involved either on the seller side or the buyer side? And I want you to raise your hand and just put it right in front of your face with more than in, have you been in a transaction that has involved more than five buyers? If so, put your hand up. So you've been in there. There's been almost everybody's more than five buyers. Okay. How about more than 10? So you at least tried for more than in a situation where there was at least 10 offers in there. Okay. So that's the majority of people. So the reason I'm doing that is so you can, the majority of us, you can say that you are in a large training with your office today where the majority of people have experienced multiple offer situations that have involved more than 10 offers. And if you can't use that to set a buyer's expectation, I'm not sure what's going to do it. So when you're meeting with a buyer and preparing them to start making offers, say, Hey, I would expect there to be more than 10 offers on any of the properties. So you're going to be competing against nine other people with any other offer you put forward based on what I heard today. Does that make sense? So understand that's a one in 10 chance of getting this house. So we need to be strong and we need to look for ways to separate yourself. Price is just one of the ways, as Felicia just said, I mean, we also have appraisals, a huge one, inspections are huge ones, time frames are huge ones, letting sellers lease back or doing a seller contingency so they can find another house first, allowing anything and everything, right? You can write a love letter and say you're a good Presbyterian family. Just kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> joke. You got the, uh, sorry. I just, got a, I just got an offer accepted and the buyer, I did all of those things. I coached the buyer along. They were from Arizona, so they had sticker shock. Um, a model match to what we were offering on was still pending. So I already had a relationship with that agent because I closed a deal with her in November. So I just called her and said, you know, please, when is it closing? What did you guys get? Um, and we went in 65,000 over list Plus we're paying the seller's closing costs up to $10,000. There we go. We did, we did a coaching call. Not only did I coach the buyer, but the lender um, also coached. And we, we communicated three ways of, you know, how we can shorten things and go hit it hard the first time. We don't want to rely on getting a counter in this market. You've got to do what you're comfortable with but the strongest you can do out the gate. There um, you go, Joni. That's yeah. perfect. That's what I was looking for. Cause that, I mean, right there, see how she got her lender. So there's a third person in this, this client's ear explaining where they need to be because there is sticker shops, a big deal for everyone right now. I mean, it's amazing how, when they list their house, they have these evil fangs they're, they They just want to get every penny they can. And then they turn into this little dough when they want to go, you know, mm -hmm. buy a house. And they go, oh, it's expensive. You know, it's like the same person with two, two totally different masks on. But when they go out there on the buy side, you don't want to like have them get real time experience. You know what I mean? We don't want them learning in the field, like writing offer after offer and getting miserable. Um, that makes the whole experience bad. It makes your likelihood of referrals bad and it wastes a ton of your time and it hurts your relationship. So if we can actually speed that up, and get them to learn beforehand by you telling and showing and then getting the lender in on that. I really like that. There's another third party in there. Felicia, what were you? The same thing as Joni. I got the lender involved from the forefront. I used to work in lending. So that was my first thing before we actually even did anything. I talked to their lender and said, what can we do on your end? before we even submit any more offers because we had submitted, I think one or two and I had talked to the lender and she was kind of wavering and then she gave me a definitive answer. And so that's when our um, offer got accepted when we were able to definitively, I don't want wavering. I need to know for sure. I'm not setting my buyers up for failure and I'm not setting them up to be in a position that we're going to end up having a conversation that's not great. And so right. 
any definitive answers from the lender. So I think that's the other important thing. I think getting pre-approval from an underwriter right now, you've got all kinds of time, that's for sure. I mean, buyers have plenty of time. So let's get that thing all the way to that underwriter so we can start thinking about waiving loan contingencies and things like that, or at least reducing time frames around them. Uh, just to, if we can make ourselves look stronger, right? Um, because when you're getting 10 offers on every property, there's in all likelihood a cash offer in there somewhere, or at least someone that waived their loan contingency, which operates just like a cash offer. So we have to think if we're, you know, if you have a loan in this market, you have a blemish, your offer is not clean anymore. And they need to hear that from you. Does that make sense? Like it's not a clean offer if you're getting financing. That's a red flag. Oh, so we have to wait, you know, 10 to 17 days to see if you qualify for your loan? That might have worked in any other market, but in this market, that's not going to fly. Not in a, high, a low inventory, hot seller's market where multiple offers are coming. So I like that. And getting that lender involved with that process, getting them on the hook, getting under writ, write, written pre-approval, very important as well, too. Don't just take their word for it. And then I, I think getting on the phone, like Joni said, and, and saying, hey, can you help me explain the reality of this? I don't want us to be writing offers and writing pre-approval letters you know, for the next five months, why all the housing prices go up and having really frustrating clients. I, I need you to help me to get them real right now for their own best interests. Storytelling is a, a big part of, of how I've been able to beat out. I think my record is about 22 offers I beat with, with a, a loan. Um, that, that was a couple of years ago. But storytelling is so important because everybody is numb. I mean, the listing agents are getting numb with yeah. all these inundation of appointment requests and so when i'm asked and i only represent maybe two or three buyer clients a year because because it does you know take a lot of uh, extra time compared to, to managing a listing uh, but i always try to develop the relationship from the initial text of the appointment hi janet hope things are going well well no one ever usually shows that much con concern not that i'm that wonderful to do that it's just it's courteous uh, to try to break down the wall a little bit. And then I say, my, my, I have a, a wonderful teacher couple with W2, slam dunk or easy to, to make the deal overqualified, would like to have an appointment. So I'm sneaking in there a couple of pieces of information to add a little color to the story. Right. Just, just for the, the text to get the appointment time. Okay? And that's why I hate those automatic, automated appointment gizmos I, I avoid those when i'm representing buyers because i'm all about developing a relationship that i want you know that i i'm easy to deal with i want to do it your way You're definitely the friend of the listing agent not the buyer's agent that's for sure yeah yeah so you know reversing i actually taught a class to all four offices uh and my first statement was I do very little buyer representation, so I'm going to teach you how to do that. Yeah. And people are like, <laughs> "Yeah, it's, a, it's because you need to appease me or, or yeah. any other listing agent out there, right? Right, it's true. So why, why not get inside my head and know? And so um, I just, uh, tomorrow I'm putting under contract a, a home I remodeled in Silmar because I do have a flip business uh also and the agent in the office was very good he told me a wonderful story wonderful teacher highly qualified up to 800 k and him her and her daughter loves the place well not only do i like the story as a listing agent and an owner but i also like the fact that whenever there are little bumps in the road in an escrow People that are buyers that love the property don't get scared away because there's a bump in the road. Whereas if I've got an investor that's buying it, they don't like the bump, they're on to the next investment. Gosh, well, I hope you didn't like him because she had a daughter because the daughter's familial status and that's a violation of the 14th Amendment. Of the US <laughs> yeah, just don't ever put it in writing or it's a love letter. The, yeah, I, I think a little common sense is. I'm right with you. I, amen. How dare you sell to a teacher? There you go. That's right. Yeah, a teacher. That's good. Yeah, that's right. We're in occupation. Yeah. 
<laughs> so that's yeah. and, and I always finish as a buyer agent. I always finish it off to the listing agent. I know the money has to be there. I yeah. get it. But wouldn't it be nice every now and then we, meaning listing agent and, and I, get a wonderful chance to do something wonderful for, I like it. for our family. I and like it's it. Always nice to have that. And it, hopefully it sticks in their head a little bit. It will stick a little bit. I, I do think it does. I mean, they're going to laugh at you and say, nice try and all that stuff, but it'll stick. It'll stick. No, I like it. I really do. I like it. And I do agree is trying to get that conversation as best you can on the buy side. It'll be hard with those automatic showings. There's no doubt about it. Um, but trying to reach through and, and connect like that, I think is crucial.